the blessed glass of water. <laughs> they thought it was all over. And why wouldn't they? They had been there for Jesus' arrest and trial and murder and death and burial. And a burial signals the end, doesn't it? They had been all in with Jesus, with his inclusive welcome, his abundant love, his radical forgiveness, and his ready and familiar access to God. And they had hoped that Jesus would be the one to set Israel free. But now, his tomb, sealed with a boulder, held back all of that hope. The man, the message, the movement, gone. Can you imagine their grief and their anger? Maybe their humiliation? I sense a sort of swirling inner chaos of emptiness. You know when you have that fluttery feeling in your gut that maybe you identify as anxiety? Well, all stories, all stories have a beginning and a middle and an end. And Jesus' followers assumed that the burial marked the end of their adventure with Jesus because they couldn't conceive of anything else, at least not yet. And now they hear his body is gone. Why would someone take it? Who would do that? Is it just a cruel joke? They didn't know what to do. Some went home, some went back to work, some hid. Friends, I wonder what Easter means to you. What does an empty tomb mean to you? Has someone told you what you're supposed to believe about that, but you don't believe it? Do you maybe just feel unsettled about the whole thing? How Easter impacts you or me will change from one year to the next. Our circumstances change. So how we hear the story changes. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, preachers often preach to themselves. And I am surely doing that today. This Easter, you see, I am not so focused on resurrection as prerequisite to atonement or forgiveness or even to eternal life. This year, I'm not focused on whether Jesus is the only way or if a resuscitated corpse really walked out of that cave. What captures my attention today is that something happened. Something happened. And the people closest to Jesus felt it, and they were changed. And they wrote stories about it. And about how the love of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the way of Jesus, and the hope of Jesus lasts. I need that hope. Because this Easter, I have a troubling case of the overwhelms. It's a word, right? The overwhelms. It seems that 360 degrees around me, everything is falling apart. Everything is messed up. I wonder if you have some of those feelings about the world today. Count the ways with me. For starters, the climate. This is the year of Michigan's unweather, unwinter. Politics, another election season of court cases and lies and conspiracies and backstabbing and incivility. Just turn off the radio. 
violence. This year already, 109 mass shootings, 116 deaths. Catastrophes of one kind or another, like the bridge collapsing over Baltimore Harbor. Here we go with the supply chain threatened again. And then there's the economy. Tell me, what is it with the price of eggs? I mean, they were like $4 during the pandemic, and then a couple weeks ago, they went down to maybe 79 or 89 cents, and they're back up in the twos again. I mean, what is that about? I don't, I don't get it. And in public health, COVID still has its fangs in it. Ask Peter, like Peter Gold, who was sick this week with, with COVID. Thank God he's here. Internationally, we have the stalemate in the Ukrainian-Russian war, and we have Gaza. Gaza, the genocide of our time. More than 33,000 Palestinians and 1,100 Israelis dead and counting. I cannot bear it. And here in these days, we all, some more than others, feel a bit spiritually unmoored after Pastor Sal's departure. So yes, there is chaos out there. And that doesn't even speak to the chaos inside any one of us. So where is hope to be found? Your hope, my hope. Hope, it seems, fades when we think that we can't do anything to improve a situation. When we feel helpless to solve a problem. When what, used to, what we used to think possible evaporates into the impossible. When we don't have the strength left to move or act or sometimes even to care anymore. I can't get the image of a jack-in-the-box out of my head. How many of you had them growing up? In some ways, they're rather frightening, aren't they? <laughs> I felt like I imagined that clown would feel listening to that insipid music again and again and again <laughs> while the handle cranks. It's expecting to be released but the tune always stops right before the pop goes the weasel. And it remains strapped in the dark, as if the lid was glued down. So I'm looking for a way out of the confining darkness. We need a hope for the planet. We need a hope for peace. We need a hope for justice, a hope for the end of brutally stupid political shenanigans. Now, what does this look like? What does that kind of hope look like? Well, it's more than an encouragement to hang in there. Although waiting, not necessarily patiently, is a necessity of hope. A hope more than that, that meme that has the the helplessly frantic cat, you know, hanging on, trying to not let go with the caption, hang in there. I'm talking about hope that's not mere optimism or wishful thinking or positive thinking. I mean, sometimes the glass just isn't half full, right? I need hope, and I don't expect all to be well by a wave of a magic wand. I'm talking about a hope that offers possibility beyond my rational, cognitive, limited vision. I'm talking about a hope that can move away the stone boulder from a tomb, from a cave. I need a hope that gives courage and stamina to see the good in spite of the bad. To keep my eyes on a tiny flickering light at the end of a long tunnel.
So any English majors out there? All right, one or two. So there's a word called respare. Respare. I didn't make it up. Until the late 16th century, it was in common usage. So bear with me for a little wordplay here. If you put a D, <coughs> D in front of a word, what do you get? Hmm? Undone. Undone. Okay, you're doing something, you're, you're removing something, right? Like return, or refund, or rejoice. So we, or defund, I messed up. You have defund, you have uh, despair, despair, because the Latin, Latin word for hope is spare. They just spelled it differently, spare. So maybe it's time to revive this word from despair to respare, the return of hope. The events of and after Easter illustrate this move from despair to respare. It occurred to me walking into the sanctuary this morning, we have what was despair in that big purple black blob, blob. <laughs> There's probably a better word for it. And that has been respared into a, a greening, life abundant cross. So, so it happened, Julie, my pages are still out of order. <laughs> okay. So the events of Easter are illustrating this move. For example, Mary claims that she saw Jesus outside the tomb. Mostly the men think she's nuts, but it seems worth following up on, no? So Peter goes and he finds no body, but just finds a shroud. Maybe Mary's onto something. Galilean anglers hear a voice from shore telling them where to throw their nets. They squint to see who it is. Yeah, like how does this stranger dude know anything about our lake? but something compels them to try it. They shift their nets to the other side of the boat and in no time, their nets are bursting with tilapia. <laughs> that is the Galilean fish. Soon they're on the shore and looking on as Jesus is flipping the grilled fish and breaking the pita bread. Soon breakfast fills stomachs and hope trickles into hearts. That Sunday afternoon, two of Jesus' followers debrief the past few days on their seven-mile trek to the village of Emmaus. A stranger catches up to them, joins their conversation, and puts a rather different spin on the narrative of the past. And they eagerly absorb his words. Through a tiny crack, in the rock, hope dribbles in. They invite him to stay for the evening. And as they have their meal, as they dip their shared bread into the olive oil and eat it, they recognize Jesus. And then he's gone. They scurry back to Jerusalem bursting with the news because hope has popped out of the box for them. <clears throat> the disciples are learning that they aren't at the end of the story. It's not over till it's over. Their respair begins by reorienting where they are in the course of the story. And that's what we need to do too. To rethink where are we in the 
the course of our story. Last month, I got a dose of respair at what might be an unlikely location at a lecture by historian Heather Cox Richardson. I suspect some of you know of her. She's the author of several books about the Civil War, the rise of the original Republican Party, and the course of American democracy. I read her email daily. They come almost like a devotional in my email every day. The lecture was at the House of Hope Presbyterian Church. The name of the venue was not lost on me or on her. She said that even with all of the challenges in our political system right now, even with the rise of Christian nationalism, even with the upheaval of political parties, she has hope for the future, for the future of our country. Well, I leaned forward in my balcony seat a little bit and listened more intently. She has hope because she is a historian. Yes, this is a dangerous time for our country, she said, and for the whole world, but she doesn't name this as the beginning of the end. She positions this country as being in the middle of a, a messy middle, of a much longer narrative. She has studied other times when our democracy was in jeopardy, the end of the 20th century, and it didn't die. She reminds us that history rhymes. She made a point of saying that it wasn't just Abraham Lincoln who changed the course of the country all by himself. It was ordinary people who might disagree on governing philosophies, on the issues, but on the democracy holding together, they were united. Ordinary people kept us whole. She reminded the audience that before a butterfly emerges from its chrysalis, it has existed as caterpillar soup. Inside that hard shell that we see hanging on a branch, enzymes have dissolved the caterpillar's organs and muscles. Other enzymes signal dormant pre-butterfly cells to activate. When we see a caterpillar spinning a chrysalis, we think we're saying a final goodbye as all we see is disappearance and death. But the change into a butterfly happens in the dark, in the chaotic in-between. And it does for us, too. The arc of God's story with humanity is long. And yes, it leans forward. It leans forward by hope. God is the superstar respairer. It's just who God is. It's how God works. From despair to respair, from chaos to hope. It isn't just a straight line, though. God specializes in creating new life out of chaos and despair. God created the cosmos out of primal muck. Read the first verse of the first chapter of Genesis. God freed enslaved persons from Pharaoh and guided them on a long walk, a long walk to become a nation, a people. Then Jesus took a page out of God's playbook and gathered a ragtag bunch of nobodies to create a following. Later at Pentecost, God's spirit lands on an international gathering who couldn't even understand each other, and the church is birthed. But Easter, Easter is God's masterpiece. This year, this Easter, I look at the empty tomb and I choose hope. I choose to move 
that stone of despair aside. And yes, it's heavy work. But I choose to move it so that hope can again roam free. It'll be easier to live with myself. And once we learn to look for hope, the clearer our vision becomes to see Christ who embodies that hope. And to join with Christ's followers, acting even in their own pain, and in their own sadness and grief, acting in kingdom ways, advocating for justice, working for equality, demanding civility in the public sphere, the sphere caring for creation, supporting the sick, praying, praying for those who are seeking our new pastor, doing something, however small, So where is your hope? Don't let it remain entombed. Open your eyes and your heart to the possibilities of being surprised, surprised as out of chaos comes hope. Our friend Richard Rohr wrote in today's meditation, to be a Christian is to be inevitably and forever a person of hope. God in Christ is saying, this is what will last. My life and my love will always and forever have the final word. And let the people say, Amen. Amen.